Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Fat Man Little Trail, the podcast where everyone is invited on this journey. My name, of course, is Greg the Fat Man, the founder of FatManLittleTrail.com, and of course, the host of this podcast. Um, I want to thank everybody for all their support. I just got a note this week that said that I am the 74th ranked podcast in the wilderness category in Canada. So apparently, I am a very big deal. Ryan Reynolds, watch out. I'm coming for you to be Canada's number one. Um, If you like the podcast, again, make sure you uh, like it and share it on whatever platform that you are on. If you're watching on YouTube, go ahead and follow me on that that YouTube channel. And uh, if you want to make a donation to help out the podcast and and make it a little bit more professional, uh, there's a, a link in my bio that Uh, you can make a donation, a monthly donation, and I would really appreciate that. I want to get right into my chewing the fat segment. This might be the most important chewing the fat segment uh, for backcountry people that I, that I have this year. Um, My guest today is part of a group that every hiker, skier, snowshoer hopes they never have to meet, but are very happy that they are there in case of an emergency. Anna DiBattiste is the public information officer of the uh, Summit County Search and Rescue Group. And Anna, thank you so much for joining me today. Yeah, thanks for having me, Greg. Glad to be here. Did I say the name of the the group right this time? Uh, It's actually Summit County Rescue Group. Um, And the reason it matters is because Summit County Search and Rescue is a group in Utah. I I apologize for that. Uh, I just keep throwing the search in there. So could you tell me a little bit just uh, of the background of the Summit County uh, Rescue Group? Yeah, absolutely. So we've been around since 1973. Uh, we have anywhere between 60 and 75 members at any given time. And we're all volunteers. We're a nonprofit. Uh, even our mission coordinators and board members are volunteers. And basically we go to work where the pavement ends. So if you get lost or, or injured in the back country in an area that's not covered by a ski patrol, um, then we're the ones who come and get you. So that's, that's really interesting to me because I was under the assumption, I think a lot of people are under the assumption that, that you are part of, you know, like the firefighting teams or you're, you're part of a public service, but you're actually all volunteer and nonprofit, huh? Yeah, that's correct. In different states uh, handle backcountry search and rescue in different ways, but in Colorado, it is the county sheriffs that have the statutory responsibility for backcountry search and rescue. And most county sheriffs uh, delegate that responsibility out to volunteer groups. So as volunteer groups, are you, and and nonprofits, are you uh, able to take donations if people are, are want to donate to your group? We sure are. And thanks for asking that. We, we pretty much exist on donations and grants. Um, Our team is uh, one of the busiest in the state. And in fact, last year, I believe we were the busiest in the state. Um, more missions means more needs for training and equipment, and that means more need for funding. Um, and the way to donate to us is on our website at scrg.org. Like I said, I was, I was completely surprised to find out that it was a, a, a nonprofit and a volunteer organization. So really important for everybody to know that so that they know when they go out, if they're going to get in the back country you know, make sure that, that, you know, who's coming to get you. And if you have a chance to donate, that would be amazing. Um, so to take me through just a little bit of, of what happens with, with you guys, you get a distress call and then like, how do you send people out? What kind of materials and what kind of, um, you know, like vehicles and things like that do you have? Yeah, sure. So, so first of all, we have 10 mission coordinators and they rotate in an on-call role for one week, uh, each. So when a 911 call comes into county dispatch, um, they contact whoever the on-call mission coordinator is for that week. And then that mission coordinator needs to decide what kind of response is called for. Um, And that can range, you know, widely. So for, um, for example, a call might just be somebody who's gotten a little turned around and that mission coordinator can talk them back to the trailhead over the phone from his dining room table. Uh, without ever putting any resources in the field. Um, Sometimes we might get a a call from someone who's injured, but is on or close to a four wheel drive road so that a sheriff's office deputy that works with our team can just drive a UTV in there and pick them up. Um, Other times the mission coordinator might decide to do what we call a limited call. 
and they might put out a call for say, uh, you know, I need two fast hikers or I need four experienced snowmobilers. And then we have what's called an all call. And that's where the mission coordinator decides we need a full team response here. So then all of the members of the team will get a text message saying, please respond to such and such trailhead. Um, if you can go, you go. And if you can't, you can't, because we all have day jobs. And that's why we have so many members is to make sure there's enough of us available for any given call. Um, and then how we deploy into the field really just depends on the nature of the call and the terrain and the weather and all of that. So it might be on foot, it might be on snowmobiles, ATVs, UTVs, skis, snowshoes, you know, it really just depends. Do you have access to like meta flight, like from dispatch or, or anything like that? Flight for Life Colorado. Yes, we work very closely with them. Uh, Lifeguard 2 is based here in the county in Frisco, and we use them very frequently. We also have access to, um, through our membership with the Colorado Search and Rescue Association, we have access to military helicopters. So say that we have somebody in very extreme terrain that would be difficult or dangerous for us to reach them, and um, it's a critical incident in which that person is, um, you know, life, limb, or eyesight is threatened. Uh, we can, um, through the, the state coordinators that work for CSAR, we can request a helicopter out of the National Guard uh, High Altitude Training Center in Eagle. And those birds can do uh, hoist rescue. Okay. Um, so the, the equipment that, you know, you talked about snowshoes and snowmobiles, is that all part of the organization and, and relying on those donations as well? Or is that something that each person who's a member, you know, uses their own snow machine? Yeah, that's another really good question. So um, when it comes to, to big equipment, like, you know, ATVs and snowmobiles, we have team gear. But when it comes to things like skis and snowshoes, uh, our volunteer members not only are volunteering their time, but they're spending their own money to outfit themselves, um, to buy gas, to get to missions. Um, so so we, we pay out of pocket uh, quite a bit of money uh, to be able to volunteer our time. And again, that's fascinating to me. So, and I'm sure a lot of people listening to that didn't realize that these groups are, are volunteer based. So make sure if you have a chance to, uh, to donate, go ahead and do that. Um, I got to ask, do you get uh, more calls in the, in the winter months with like avalanche rescue since you're in the mountains or is it more in the summer or is it, does it vary at all? We're actually busier in the summer. Okay. Uh, we go out for all kinds of backcountry recreationists, you know, skiers, snowmobilers, um, climbers, hikers, hunters and fishermen, um, you know, the occasional paraglider or, or kite skier or downed aircraft. Um, but by far, the largest group that we rescue is hikers. And that's more in the summer. Have you found that in the last two years since kind of 2020 pandemic and stuff that more and more people are getting out. Does that mean that more and more people are getting themselves into bad situations? Are you being called more in the last couple of years? We are. Yeah. In 2019, our total number of calls was 144 in 2020. It was 185. And in 2021, it was 217. Now that's wow. not all missions. That's just the number of calls that went into the coordinator. And in some cases they, they handled it pretty quickly on their own. Um, but still the number of calls has been steadily going up. And I do think COVID plays a role. Um, but I also think that it's just a, it's a trend that's, um, that's been continuing unrelated to COVID for, for quite a few years now. <laughs> Um, so, so Colorado's become more and more popular for visitors, and outdoor recreation has become more and more popular for for residents as well. I mean, what you said in in twenty twenty one, you had two hundred and some calls. I mean, that's almost sixty percent of the days of the year somebody's making a call. Are you seeing a situation where where you're getting called when you probably shouldn't be called, where somebody's just too tired and they don't want to walk back down? Um, or is, are all of the calls legit? And when should somebody call? Yeah, that's another great question. So we, we 
we have seen what I would call a trend in expectation of service. And occasionally we do get a call from somebody who's just tired and thinks that we're gonna swoop in on a helicopter and pick them up. Um, and, and, you know, and, and obviously um, that is not how we wanna use our resources, especially air resources. Helicopters are expensive, they're dangerous um, and they're not free. Our services are free, but if you have a medevac helicopter flight for life, you're gonna be charged for that. Um, so, um, so yeah, we do occasionally get a call that, that, um, maybe shouldn't have been a call, but for the most part, we want people to know that we're here for you if you need us. And there are no charges for our services. We don't want fear of being charged to cause someone to not call when they need us or to delay calling. Um, sometimes what happens is people who think they're going to get charged, they wait and now a call that could have had everybody out of the field and back home in time for dinner turns into a 2 a.m. call when the, the weather is worse, the injuries are worse. Um, you know, um, it's harder to do in the dark. Um, so that's something we really want to avoid. The, um, the Colorado Search and Rescue Association, CSAR, um, has a website with some great resources uh, on their blog. There's a blog called uh, Rescue Helicopters Are Not an Uber. There's <laughs> another one. There's another one called um, When Should I Call for Search and Rescue? And there's another one called How to Handle a Backcountry Emergency. And those are all resources I would direct folks to. Those are great resources. I, I'll be honest. I do think that there should be a like a gondola or a zip line at the top of every single hike. So by the time you get to the top, you can just zip line down. But in all actuality, a lot of times people don't realize that, sure, it took me six miles to walk up, but now I have to walk six miles back. And, you know, there's a big difference in, in walking six miles and 12 miles. And I think if you're not used to the back country or you're not used to hiking and you just look on a map and say, oh, that's not that far. People don't calculate that, that count that time back in. And I've seen people who are just tired and exhausted and sitting on the trail and I'm like, you're okay. And they're like, yeah, could you carry me? No, I'm not carrying you. <laughs> Get up and walk down. But those are the people that, that you don't want to make those calls. When, what are some mistakes that people make that get them in dangerous situations that you've seen that, that, that get them out there, like maybe not bringing a light in the, you know, a, a, a um, sunset hike, they don't bring a light and it turns dark and they get lost or something. Are there some simple mistakes that people make? Yeah. Um, I would say there are four main categories of um, the most frequent mistakes that people make. One is not being prepared, not, not carrying what they should be carrying. And we can go through that in a minute. Um, another is just not doing their homework, um, not knowing before they go uh, what they're getting into. Um, and another is underestimating the terrain or the weather. And then finally, overestimating their own abilities, kind of like you said, when, when people don't think about the fact that six miles in means six miles out too. And six miles in for you means six miles in for us to get to you. So that's going to take some time. So what are those, uh, you, you mentioned it briefly about the things to bring. What are some of those things to bring the 10 important things maybe? Yes, right. So we call those the 10 essentials. And if you're gonna be in the back country for any length of time, we recommend you have all 10 of them. And that includes uh, food, water, plenty of water, um, some kind of navigation tools. And with that, we recommend that you not rely strictly on a GPS nat navigation tool because batteries die and satellites get blocked. And, you know, so it's good to know how to use a map and compass. You want to have extra layers um, because this is Colorado and it might be 70 degrees and sunny when you set out and it might be 30 degrees and snowing by the end. Um, then you want to have some kind of sun protection. You want to have some kind of fire starter, uh, some kind of shelter, a first aid kit, a headlamp or a flashlight, like you already mentioned. And uh, we also recommend a whistle. And then if you're doing that, something that's fairly lengthy um, or you're getting into extreme terrain, we do uh, love it when people have some sort of emergency um, uh, communication device. 
And there are different types there, but we most like it when people have some sort of uh, two-way satellite communication device. Because when a, a personal locator beacon that just sends a signal and has no two-way capability notifies us, all we get is, you know, somebody's in trouble in this approximate location. We don't know what that is. We don't know if it's life-threatening. Um, you know, we don't know if it's, uh, you, you know, if it's somebody with pre-existing medical conditions or somebody who's just a little bit lost. Whereas if it's a two-way communication device, uh, we can figure out exactly what's going on. We can ask questions and then figure out what kind of resources we might actually need. Is there, I've seen both. Is there a preference between two-way communications that, that can only take, or can, that can take calls or ones that can only take text that you prefer? Um, so I, I wouldn't, we, we don't really endorse brands, um, but the ones that could allow you to send a specific text message and, and allow us to respond with questions are ideal. So a text message would be okay. I just wanted to make sure it didn't have to be phone, you know, voice communication, but a text message would be good. Yeah, absolutely. When, what do you, um, so is a whistle what you would suggest for um, signaling? Because once, once they come up, like you said, a lot of times they might only have, or you guys might only have a, a approximate position. And if you've slid down somewhere or you, you know, fell off and you're, you're not on the trail anymore, you might be harder to find. Is the whistle the best way to signal somebody who's getting close to you? Yeah, the whistle really, really travels. Um, in fact, when we're out on a search, we all carry whistles and we use them to try to get the attention of the person we're looking for. Oh, great. And well, and in, in, you know, you never know if it's going to be daylight or nighttime. So lights can have different things. And so whistle will carry in any condition, basically, right? Yeah. Yeah. And they, they, they cost very little. They weigh almost nothing, you know, um, just stick one on your pack and it's there if you need one. And a lot of packs come with built-in whistles now, which I've seen, which is really a, a nice feature and it doesn't, doesn't d distract from the pack at all. And, and it just hooks onto one of the, the clips. So you really don't even know it's there, which is great. Um, do you offer training or backcountry like safety courses or anything like that for, for hikers or people that are new to the backcountry? We do. So we, we, um, we call it PSAR, which stands for preventative search and rescue. And we do a number of things throughout the year. So um, we have folks that go to outdoor gear shops around Summit County and do a talk called Backcountry Emergency 101. We just started that recently. Uh, for years, we've been visiting schools and, and programs like Keystone Science School uh, to talk to kids about what to do if, they get, if they're on a hike with their parents and they get separated. Um, we also attend community events and you know, have booths there like the Copper Safety Fest, which we're actually doing tomorrow, um, or the Safe Summer Kickoff in Silverthorn, or this year we did the Winter Carnival in Silverthorn. You know, so we'll have a booth where we'll talk to people about the 10 essentials or about avalanche awareness, or if they have kids. Um, you know, one new thing we started doing is we'll bring a couple of dolls and a toy cell phone and we'll teach them how to dial 911 if they see somebody um, hurt in the back country. Um, so yeah, we, we, uh, we get a lot of requests to come speak to various groups or, or to man a booth at a, an event and, and we always try to respond to those. Is that the best way that people can educate them, oops, that people can educate themselves on safety uh, in the backcountry, or would you suggest um, any other resources that people can find to make sure they're as safe as possible? There's all kinds of resources out there. Um, so, if we're talking about winter recreation and and folks will be anywhere near any kind of avalanche terrain, then we we recommend getting on the Colorado Avalanche Information Center website. There are all kinds of resources for um, for education there, including a starter program called Know Before You Go. Um, and then uh, the Colorado Mountain Club has a lot of educational resources that we recommend. Um, and then some of the teams around Colorado have some, some online resources or some more structured in-person educational resources. So Alpine Rescue Team, for example, down in Clear Creek, uh, they haven't been doing it lately because of COVID, but, um, you know, but they offer uh, 
public seminars on various safety topics right there at their headquarters. Um, you mentioned avalanche risk there. And I was wondering, because a lot of people are, like you said, are new to Colorado and are new to um, outdoor exercising and recreation. And I think I've seen a lot of new people hiking in winter that I, I didn't see the last year. So is the are the 10 essentials the same when you're hiking in the winter? Or is there an adjustment? Do you need a shovel or anything like that? Yeah, so there's a few adjustments there. Um, first of all, you want to know, no matter what kind of backcountry recreationist you are, if you're going to be out in the winter, you need some basic understanding of what constitutes avalanche terrain. What is a slope that is steep enough to slide? So a lot of times, um, winter hikers and snowshoers think that if I'm just going out on a trail, I'm not a skier, I'm not a snowmobiler, I'm not going to extreme terrain, I don't need to know anything about this or have any gear. Well, two weeks ago, uh, two snowshoers and their dog were killed here in Summit County by an avalanche up on Hoosier Pass. They were just out for a, a snowshoe. They had no avalanche education. They had no gear. They didn't have a transceiver or probe or shovel. And they probably had no idea whatsoever that they needed that stuff. And yet the trail they were on, which was a well-traveled packed down trail, crossed avalanche terrain and, um, and, and they were killed. So, so yeah, you need the knowledge of what constitutes avalanche terrain and then you either need to avoid it or carry avalanche gear, transceiver, probe, and shovel, and know how to use them, get some training. And then the other thing that's different in the winter is, of course, you've got to beef everything up. You know, the, the layers of clothing you carry, the, the shelter that you carry, um, you know, just any, anything in that 10 essentials list that's related to the cold, you're going to need more of it. One of the reasons I reached out to you is... Um because of that couple that, that died on uh, Hoosier Pass, I had actually hiked Hoosier Pass the week before that. And I didn't get as far out as North Star Mountain. I just went to that one, that first little hill, that, that 12,000 foot hill that's there. And I thought that it was a completely safe, you know, area to, to snowshoe. And I was like, oh, there's that wide service road. It should be fine. It should be easy. And then, you know, a week later, I found out that, that tragically some people had passed away. And it made me realize that I didn't know what, what I, you know, what I thought was safe might not have been safe. So I was like, I need to, to talk to somebody about this and, and find out what, what really is safe. And there's also a risk too of, of what's above you. So is that right? If you're hiking on a, on a, like a low plane and you don't think that it's going to be that bad, but if there's skiers and, and like people snowshoeing or um, snowboarding above you, that could add risk to your hike in the winter, right? Absolutely. And um, it doesn't even have to be people above you. If there's avalanche terrain above you, meaning, you know, terrain that with a slope angle of generally speaking, 30 to 45 degrees, then it's possible for you to trigger an avalanche from below, even though there's nobody else up there. And wow. you're not alone. So many people have no idea about this. It's been quite the conversation across the state for the past two weeks, because while it's rare to have folks um, who are just hikers or snowshoers on a trail killed in an avalanche, it, it does happen. And it makes everyone realize um, that, you know, we, we have so many, so many people that, that don't know what, what they don't know. They don't realize that they need to be able to assess that avalanche terrain. There was a sign, I don't know if you noticed it when you were up there, but there was a warning sign, an avalanche warning sign at the trailhead at Hoosier Pass that these folks would have walked right past. And we don't know if they noticed it or not, but um, we do know the general trend is that it's not that people ignore signs, they just don't think that the sign applies to them. I did see that. I did see the sign and I actually read the sign. And that's one of the reasons why I didn't continue down to, to that North star area. And I just went to that first kind of, I don't, I don't even know if that, that first Hill has a, a name to it. Um, but you know, I was like, okay, well it's avalanche. And, and I was hiking down and even though that, that first Hill isn't, it's not very steep and it's, or it's not very tall, at least it's, it's relatively steep, but I saw like an entire side like there was a little crack running through the snow. And I was like, I think that's a sign that I shouldn't be here. 
But again, I don't know enough about it, which is which is why I wanted to, to find some more resources. What are some of the signs to look for if you're out hiking or snowshoeing or skiing or whatever you're doing? But what are some signs to look for that might be a higher risk of an avalanche other than um, the grade of the, the hill? Yes. So the first thing is, is the slope angle. Absolutely. Um, uh, but then if, if you are um, in that danger zone in terms of slope angle, um, you're looking for, you hit on one of them already, cracking. Um, and then sounds like whumping, uh, which means that the, the layers of snow are um, settling and moving. Um, and those are probably the two biggest things. Um, the, the, the easiest and safest thing to do is just stay away from that that danger zone in terms of slope angle. And you, you mentioned the resource before, but I, I'd like you to mention again, because it's, it's so important, but you can actually go out and get avalanche forecasts and find out what days are, are better and what days are worse because, because the weather does affect avalanche risk as well. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So the Colorado avalanche information center, the CAIC um, puts out a daily forecast on their website and on their social media channels. They're on uh, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And, um, and then where I really recommend starting, if you have no experience with any of this, is take their online Know Before You Go program, which is free. And um, that's a good way to get started in identifying avalanche terrain and uh, knowing how to avoid it, and knowing how to stay safer in it. And one thing I think that is important that we talk about, because you know, we've been, we've, we've talked about backcountry a lot on this, but the Hoosier Pass is a, a well-known, well-traveled trail. So the risks aren't just in the backcountry, but risks can be anywhere that you're out hiking or anywhere that you're out in nature, right? Well, I think, um, you know, I've noticed this in social media comments since the accident. Um, people have this perception that if they're on, the tra- on a trail, it's not the backcountry. Um, it is the backcountry. Uh, just because you're on the trail doesn't mean that you're not in in avalanche train. It doesn't mean you it doesn't mean you're not in the backcountry. You still have all the same safety considerations as if you went off trail. And I th- I think there's a false sense of of security and a false sense of safety when you're on a trail because you're like oh a million people have walked on this before. I don't need to worry, you know. And you think the only people that are going to be affected are those those fools that climb up to the top of a mountain so they can ski down it or something, you know, but you think that because you're on a trail that you're going to be safe, right? You are exactly right. I think that is, that is, that is what people think. And we need to challenge that. Um, You know, we need to get the word out that um, accidents happen on trails as well. Yeah. And I've, I can't tell you how many times I've turned an ankle on a trail. You know, it could be something as simple as that, because if you're five miles in and you turn an ankle or you, you know, sprain a knee, you're going to struggle to make those five miles back, right? Yeah, you sure are. Anna, what is, if you could ask everyone who who recreates outside in the, you know, no matter what time of year it is in the back country, what is one favor that you would ask them to do to make your jobs easier? and to make their lives safer? Well, first of all, all the prepared stuff that we already talked about, you know, carrying the 10 essentials and planning carefully. And, oh, here's one that we didn't mention yet. Uh, We really love it when people make a detailed plan and leave it with somebody back home and then stick to that plan. So tell somebody where you're going, uh, where you're going to be parked, what time you expect to be back, and what's a reasonable amount of, of cushion time there uh, after which they should um, consider you missing and, and make that 911 call. That really helps us out when people do that because um, now we know what trail had to go to, you know, if somebody's reported overdue, we know what trail had to go to to verify that their car is there. We know what their plan was and when they should have been back reasonably. And that helps us uh, plan resources in terms of going to look for them. So um, that's another important part of preparedness. The other thing, um, especially in light of the avalanche two weeks ago that we would like to ask of people is if you're a pretty experienced backcountry recreationist, keep your eyes open for those newbies at the trailhead that might benefit from your experience. 
know, this is something that uh, the CAIC said recently on their uh, social media channels. They said, you know, if you're if you're out there and, and um, you're pretty experienced with reading and understanding the avalanche forecast and you see somebody that might have absolutely no idea that they're in avalanche terrain, talk to them. You know, give them the benefit of your experience. Something like that could have prevented the tragedy on Hoosier Pass two weeks ago. Absolutely. Um, one follow-up question to that about leaving a detailed plan. I've heard some people say like you should write down your trailhead and stuff like that and leave it on your car window. Um, do you suggest that? Uh, it's not a bad idea. Um, you know, we, we used to have something that we called a dashboard card that we gave out at our PSAR events. Uh, we did find, however, that um, some people became concerned that leaving something like that on your dashboard alerts a would-be car thief that you're going to be gone for a particular period of time. Mm -hmm. So there is that consideration. You know, another thing that you might do is write down your plan and leave it in the glove box. Because if you are reported missing, um, then a sheriff's office deputy is um, probably going to try to get into that car uh, looking for clues, you know, so that we, we know where, where to look for you. And that way you're not alerting any potential thieves. That makes a great amount of sense. Um, I think we've covered a lot of ground here and I think we've got some great information. Uh, is there anything that, that I didn't think of to ask you that you, you just want to get out there and, and some information for people? I don't think so. I think we covered a lot. I think we did, did a good job. And Anna, thank you so much. We're going to take a, a quick break, but before we do that, I just want to remind everybody again that the, Summit County Rescue Group is a volunteer organization and they are uh, reliant on donations. And if you want to rely on them to be helping you in the back country, if you get yourself in trouble, uh, if you have any money that you could donate, that'd be a great time to do it right now. But we will take a quick little break. And when we come back, we'll have a little bit of fun with Anna and we will talk about uh, some rapid fire questions and we'll let her ask me a question or two. So stick around. Hey guys, welcome back to Fat Man Little Trail, the podcast. We are talking with Anna De Batiste about uh, some back row or backcountry uh, safety, and um, but that was a little serious. So now we're going to have a little bit of fun, and we're going to start with a buffet. Anna, are you ready? This is very stressful. The rapid fire questions are coming. Okay, I'm nervous. All right, here we go. Number one, for you personally, would you rather be camping, glamping, or staying in a hotel? Ooh, I'm, I'm 56 now. So I've kind of moved from camping to glamping. I like it. I, I'm all for the hotels and I'm only 40. Um, number two, if you're going out to travel, would you rather be on a road trip or would you rather fly to your destination? I'd rather fly to my destination. I, I hate those long road trips. I have to say. Gotcha. Number three, what is your go-to snack when you're on the trail? Um, I, I, this is boring, but I eat all kinds of bars, you know, kind bars and power bars and any, any kind of energy bar, really. I say it every time. My favorite are the uh, white chocolate and macadamia nut cliff bars. And I'm going to keep telling you, telling everybody about them until cliff sponsors me or something, but they are wonderful. If you haven't tried them, give it a try. Uh, number four, what is the first thing that you want to eat or drink when you're done with a long hike? Hmm. Probably pasta. The one thing that I should not be eating. <laughs> <laughs> but it's so good. Why do they make it all is. the bad stuff taste so good? I know. And the last question, this is the hard one. If you could be anywhere right now, would you rather be in the forest, on a mountain, or at the beach? Oh, on a mountain for sure. Absolutely. I love it. Even though the mountains are covered in snow these days, they're still beautiful. Yeah. All righty. Uh, well, you've made it through the buffet. Congratulations. And now it is time for hike of the week. This is when I usually talk about my, one of my favorite hikes, but since you are the guest, Anna, the honor is all yours. So go ahead and give us one of your favorite hikes. So there's so many beautiful hikes in Summit County that I really struggled to figure out uh, what I could call my favorite. And I, I came up with sort of a group of hikes instead of one particular hike, but I love the hikes that go up to high altitude lakes in the Gore Range. 
So like Upper Slate, um, Lower Boulder Lake, Cat Upper Cataract Lake, Willow, Salmon, um, those are all out and back, pretty burly hikes, um, very beautiful. And the ones that are further up north, like Slate and Boulder, um, tend to be a lot less crowded than a lot of other trails in Summit County. Those are beautiful. I, I, I did Willow Lakes. That, that's the one that's in the Frisco area, right? You can get there from Frisco if you go up. Um, let me think about that. Yeah. So if you if you went up uh, the Meadow Creek Trail and then over the pass, you could get there that way. But that wouldn't be the logical way to go. The logical way would be to go out of um, the Willow Willow the Willow. You'd go to the Willow Brook Development and then go out the trailhead there, which I think is just called. Um, Willow Falls, Willow Creek. I'm not sure exactly. And up from there. I think I, I think I'm confusing it because I think I did Willow Falls from that neighborhood. But it's a beautiful area, and especially in the fall, it's really nice in the fall with all the the aspens that are around that area. Yeah, it's gorgeous up there. Well, that is a wonderful hike and a wonderful place to to spend your time outdoors recreating and. Uh, this is the part that I don't like as much. It's the new segment called Ask the Fat Man, where my guest gets to ask me any question they'd like. Anna, what do you have for me? So I I love stories. I'm a storyteller, and I love to hear other people's stories. And I would like to hear a story from you about, um, you know, what, what's the, the, best, the best narrative you've ever heard about somebody who overcame physical challenges to get more active and spend more time outdoors? That is a wonderful question. Um, there's a there's a, a young lady who I had on my my podcast, and we've become friends through through Instagram and then the podcast. And um, her name is Amanda, and she runs. Uh, she just started a website actually called National Park Capable, and Amanda has cerebral palsy, but she's still traveling to all of the different uh, national parks to try to educate people on where they can go within these national parks that are um, uh, capable and, and accessible for somebody who, who might have a disability. Um, Amanda spends sometimes uh, in a wheelchair, sometimes uh, she's okay enough that, that she can out, get out and walk. And uh, the cool thing was after I had her on my podcast, her and her husband made it over to Rocky Mountain National Park, and I was able to go up and meet with them. And we hiked from uh, the Bear Lake Trailhead all the way up to, was it Dream? What? The Lake Pass Dream, which I don't, Gem Lake, I think it was, or Emerald Lake, one of those lakes. And it ended up being about a seven mile uh, round trip hike in the snow. And, it, and uh, when we were done with it, uh, she told me that it was the longest hike that she had done. And it was one of the most um, the humbling things. It was just, just to be with her and, you know, we took extra breaks and, but she just, 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 just went for it. Like a lot. I mean, she was doing a lot better than me in a lot of the spots. Cause you know, it's not, not the hardest to hike in the world, but it's not an easy hike by any means. Um, and just to see her, her determination to finishing this hike. And it was a day that it was, it was freezing cold. And it was like, it started with like cold rain coming down on us, but there was snow on the ground. So it was like a misty, like frozen mist. And I was like, maybe we should just stop it at, um, you know, dream Lake. We don't need to go all the way to Emerald. We don't, or yeah, I think it is Emerald. And I'm like, we don't need to keep going. It's an extra, you know, mile out and mile back, you know, added to the round trip. It's snowing, it's cold, it's windy. It's, it's a typical, you know, kind of moderate weather day up in Rocky Mountain National Park in the winter. And she wouldn't stop. She just kept going. And she's like, we're going to do this. I'm going to do this. And I'm going to finish this. And it was just, it was so inspiring to be walking with her and see how much she wanted to do it and how she was determined to finish and nothing was going to stop her. And it was pretty amazing. And just getting to know her, she's just a, she's a really amazing uh, uh, person. And she's hiked in most of the, the, she lives in Utah. So she's done a lot of the state or uh, national parks that are in Utah. She's been out here. I think she's gone to Yellowstone. And what I really love about her story too, is that she's trying to give back to other people in her community and other people that might have a similar um you know, restrictions on what they can get out to, but she wants everybody to be able to see 
uh, the outdoors and how beautiful they are and, and everything that they have to offer. So she's trying to go to all these parks and find the best accessible trails for other people who might not think that they can go, you know, they might not believe they can go to Rocky mountain national park, but she's saying, look, you can do this and you can get this far, or I got this far. This is what my thoughts are on it. And I think you can do it too. Um, and it's just really inspiring and, and, and it's been so great meeting Amanda and, and getting to, to know her story a little bit. So. That's such a great story. So she's, she's, uh, how is she putting her story out to people? How is she letting people know what they can do? Sure. It's on a, it's, she has their website, nationalparkcapable.com. And, uh, she's also on Instagram, uh, under the name national park capable. Um, and she does, I think those are her two main ways that she's getting, getting her story out. Those are the two ways that I know of. Um, but her website's great. She does a, um, all ability Tuesday. I think it is. It's one of the days of the week and I don't remember which day, but it, 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 I think she calls it all abilities and it's, it's a hike that, um, she's done or that somebody else who, who might be, uh, differently capable has done and tell, uh, people about, you know, what they can do and what, what's available and what's out there for them. Oh, that's great. I'll have to check her website out. Yeah, it's, she's great. And it's, it's a very fun story. So, um, and it's been so much fun talking to you and it's such a serious topic, but I'm glad that we got to have a little bit of fun here at the end. And I really hope, like, like I said, I, I was hiking on that, that trail where the avalanche was just a week before. And, you know, I realized then that I didn't know as much as I thought I knew. And I think a lot of people will get the information from the first half of this podcast and learn some information that'll keep them safe. And uh, hopefully we'll get to a point where, we'll always love having you, but we'll never, ever need you guys to come out and help us out. That would be good. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Greg. It's been fun. It has. And that's all the time that we have for the podcast this week. I want to thank again, my guest, Anna DeBatiste of the Summit County Rescue Group. Go ahead and check their website. Anna, one more time. What's the website? SCRG.org. SCRG.org. Check the website. Uh, see what they, what they, um, the information that they have there. And if you're able to make a donation, that would be great as well. Uh, until the next time, I hope to see you all on the trail. And until then, happy hiking. <laughs>